So I'm Jennifer Dean, a research application manager from the Turing. Um, and before I turn it over to Lawrence and Rishi, um, I'd like to share a few resources that we'll be using during this workshop. So there is a comment you can see with a Google Doc. Um, and <laughs> apologies for that tunnel. Um, so in there, you'll find some information and useful links about the workshop, how to get in touch with different people after the workshop, um, and also a place at the very end uh, for anyone to add their name, any questions or notes um, during the session. So we invite you to add comments and questions throughout the workshop. I think Lawrence is gonna have special points for Q&A that we'll have in between, um, but feel free to write uh, questions in the chat or in the Google Doc. How are things going, Lawrence? Okay, I think we're going to have to go with the slight background noise for now. I'm sorry, but yeah, hopefully I can talk loud enough over over the noise, signal louder than the noise. <laughs> we'll see. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So um, thanks to everyone that's here. Although I can't see you, I think think there are some people in here um, today. Myself and Rishi are going to talk about methods to build digital twins of distributed fleets and assets of engineering systems. I've also included a subtitle, um, which is Knowledge Transfer and Engineering Fleets, which is more directly linked to the paper that is associated with what we'll talk about today in the workshop. Um, I'm Lawrence, and I'm from the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, Rishi will also be talking, he's from the University of Cambridge. Hi, you can see it. <laughs> um, and we're gonna go through a few different application case studies uh, throughout. Uh, at the outset, I wanted to highlight that this was a highly collaborative work, both with industry and people in academia. Primarily on the academic side, it was the Alan Turing Institute and the University of Cambridge. And also a special thanks to the people in industry that helped us out, particularly Scania and Visual Wind, um, who are directly related to each of the case studies that I will um, introduce as we go through. It's always useful to introduce the motivation of why, why we're doing fleet modeling at the start. Um, and the main idea is sort of why are we interested in sharing information between machines or systems and engineering? Uh, it's primarily motivated by application domains of asset management and performance and health monitoring, whereby the practical data that we see are incremental. Another word for this could be streaming. And that's to say that Data, we might have large data sets associated with assets, but they arrive incrementally throughout the operational life of a monitored system. In turn, it means that a lot of assets or systems will have rich historic data, whilst other assets within our fleet might have very sparse or limited data. The most obvious uh, example of this is if some system has been instrumented with sensors for a long period of time, it has experienced a wide variety of environmental and operational conditions, so it has a high variance, sort of information-rich data set, whereas there's a new system which has been re recently instrumented or recently uh, put into operation, and this has very sparse data. If there is some procedure for sharing information from the data-rich system to systems with limited information, this, this would maximize the value of the data collection process. Another important thing to point out is that the data is typically partially supervised. So the cost of annotating large volumes of streaming data from engineering systems is very expensive. It usually involves expert elicitation um, and that knowledge comes at a high cost. Um, despite an increasing prevalence of population data in engineering, what often happens in applications is that the modeling procedures remain system specific. So that is that we'll build a machine learning or pattern recognition model for a specific system, which will only generalize for that, for that system in operation. The main idea is that if we instead let assets constitute a wider population, the value of their combined data can be greatly extended and information can be shared between, between models of systems. The sort of more grand vision of this research is to pave the way towards an interconnected ecosystem of digital twins. This is whereby large groups of digital representations are allowed to share data and information through message passing and, and correlated variables in this context. So 
in a, in a short summary, the idea is that we are able to share information in some sense within population of, populations of similar engineering systems. In, in uh, my opinion and uh, that of the collaborators, there's two very important considerations when we move to a population level modeling procedure for engineering systems. The first is determining system similarity. So whether it even makes sense to try and share information between the data sets associated with two different assets. It would make sense to share information between vehicles of the same make and model, for example. However, sharing data between a bridge and an airplane might be a bit of a push. Um, the other very important aspect that sort of follows chronologically from establishing similarity is then developing models and procedures to allow for knowledge transfer between your pattern recognition or your standard statistical models. So that we can be relatively specific in what we're talking about when it comes to um, building these population models, I think it's useful to define a general asset management or performance and health monitoring pipeline uh, from a data centric perspective. Typically, this will involve gathering large volumes of measured data, usually incremental. This measured data will go through some pre-processing and feature extraction block to create features that are sensitive to the monitored process. So in structural health monitoring, this would be most likely damage. You want damage sensitive features, but it may also be some performance um, variable that you wish to monitor. With these features, you then apply some pattern recognition or machine learning model. It's important to emphasize that this isn't necessarily black box. Um, it, could be a, it could be a completely parameterized model. Um, and this is what we use to make predictions, given uh, the model that we've learned from data. From these predicted outputs, there's usually some level of post-processing to enable sort of diagnostic labels and actionable insight in the context of a monitoring model. So again, the focus here is methods that we use to model the data that are recorded from a large group of systems. Typically in conventional procedures, the inputs are from a single group or a single system. So the data are very si similar. The pipeline change that occurs here is that now we are considering populations. So we have inputs from a collected set of groups. This could be individual systems or groups of similar systems. And we also want to make predictions over that, that wider population. So the, the modeling procedure is, is, is more involved. To sort of summarize the notation, the vision notation that we use throughout, this blue block represents our function, our predictive function or a task. And we have a set of K of these when we're considering a population level analysis rather than an individual model. Thankfully, there is um, existing methods to deal with um, this scenario, uh, to deal with data collected um, such as this. The key ones that I'm going to briefly summarize uh, in this slide is transfer learning. This is primarily focusing on the transfer of information from a source domain with rich and um, descriptive data to a target domain which has limited data. Um, so a scenario where we have a structure maybe that has been in use for a long period of time, has a large data set, we use that data set to um, append to a target structure with very limited data. Um, this can take many forms. Uh, one of them which can be viewed as a subset of transfer learning is domain adaptation. This method involves um, harmonizing data from different sources such that you're able to apply a single model to your data in a, in a shared space. And this is a one view of information transfer for a population of systems. The final summary I'm gonna talk about is multitask learning. And in this scenario, rather than harmonizing the data into one space and learning a model, we instead learn a set of tasks distributed over our fleet and we allow for information to transfer between these models by some other mechanism rather than direct pooling. This is the methodology that we will focus on in this work. 
and it will be used in the, each of the case studies that we talk about. So the structure from here in is that the high level overview will hopefully finish uh, around 15 minutes. There's just a, a brief discussion of multitask learning to follow. There'll be a short break for uh, any questions in between then, also a break from my rambling in between. Then there is a truck fleet survival analysis, which will be delivered in part from a Jupyter notebook, which everyone should have access to so that they can have a look at the code if they want to have an investigation of the uh, experiments. We will then have a short break and come back and look at the same model structure, or at least an adapted model structure used for a wind farm example, followed by a break. And then Rishi will present a PHM prognostics and house management example for a turbo fan monitoring case study. And we'll return for concluding remarks at the end as well. Okay, so as a relatively high level discussion of what multitask learning is, I think it's useful to first consider an engineering fleet. It's important to highlight that this is quite general and it doesn't matter particularly what your assets are in your fleet. However, you want them to be similar on some level to, to, to allow for the fact that you are having information flow between your models. So in this example, we might consider a fleet of wind turbines, whereby they're in slightly different locations. So that while the models are similar, they, they vary between systems. We could also have slightly different models within the fleet, which uh, lead to variations in their behavior and practice. Again, referring back to this idea of a model block or a task for each group, for the population level analysis, we now have a set of K tasks to learn over our collective population. These tasks might be associated with individual systems or subgroups within the fleet that are similar. The important thing here is now to think how we allow for information to flow between domains. The domain adaptation view that I spoke about would consider collapsing all of these models into one one predictor which you learn over all the data having transformed it instead you can allow information to flow by other mechanisms in this scenario we define a shared latent or unobserved variable which depend which each model depends upon this shared latent variable we also learn from the collective population and in this way all all tasks within our subfleet categorizations can be influenced by the collected population data. So if the data associated with the F2 predictor is particularly rich, because it informs the inference of the shared prior, information can flow to other domains. And say if F1 was particularly sparse, it borrows statistical strength from the data that are available in F2. And this is sort of this is a good way to view of the information flow between variables within the population model. If we imagine each of these models as cards within a card deck, we can stack them up to slightly clean up our notation so that we don't have loads of arrows everywhere. And we have a stack of K functions that we want to predict over our population of structures. And they all depend upon this unobserved latent variable, which sits outside the card deck. There is only one of those, which is shared between all members of the population. Those who are familiar with um, Bayesian machine learning methods will notice that this is sort of slowly edging towards a directed graphical model. Um, here, if we were to say that our predictors that we're learning over the fleet are just standard linear regression, whereby X represents our design matrix of inputs, Alpha are the linear weights of the model, and epsilon is some additive noise. We can replace the model block with our response variables and the linear weights. And we can either say that we know the noise, or we can treat that also as an additional latent variable. It's interesting to consider the introduction of this latent variable, which describes the noise over our task predictions, because it's important to consider at what level in the population model we want to learn this parameter. Do we believe that the noise will be different for each system or 
is the same sensing or data acquisition system present on all um, structures or systems in our fleet and we therefore expect, expect the noise parameter to be consistent. If that's the case, we can take the noise parameter outside of the card deck and learn it at the population level to gain a much better characterization of the noise over our collected fleet of assets. So at that moment, there's a, um, there's a chance for a break before I start the first case study, if anyone um, wanted to ask any questions at this stage. Um, so, so far, it doesn't seem like we have any questions in the chat and the uh, Google Doc, but I just wanted to share some information for people for how they can ask questions. So one option is to actually join the stage and ask live. So um, if you're interested in doing that, you can um, click the request to share audio and video button in the top right corner and um, we can bring you onto the stage. Uh, maybe in the next session, because I think people are okay for now. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so in that case, we can move on to the first case study, which is in close collaboration with Scania um, and involves the survival analysis of a large truck fleet, which they monitor. In particular, it's considering hazard curve prediction at the population level whereby you have to consider different subfleets of vehicles as distinct groups. To reiterate this, this theme that I'm trying to push is that the important step within make, designing your population model is really thinking about what these model blocks are going to be. In this scenario, the predictor or the function is going to be the hazard curve. The hazard curve is the probability of a component failing given that it has survived so far. Um, in this scenario, we consider both alternators and turbochargers within the large uh, truck fleet. And empirically, for a given time interval, this can be calculated as the fraction of components that have failed uh, against the fraction that have survived so far. If we look at the practical hazard data, we can see that there isn't a single function in the space. Instead, we have a function associated with one of eight subfleets and these create this uh, regular pattern across the hazard function space. We believe these groups to be associated with vehicles of similar use types. So the dark green, for example, could be associated with mining and forestry vehicles, whilst the gray line may be associated with vehicles with much less aggressive uh, environmental conditions. And these are the reasons for seeing distinct hazard functions in your feature space. Despite the fact that I think this would be referred to as a, as a big data set, it's big data, the hazard functions in this themselves can be very sparse. This is because each point in the hazard function space corresponds to at least one failure within the collected fleets of vehicles. In turn, groups of vehicles which experience very few failures will have very sparse um, hazard functions. So it's very important in this setting to consider whether data rich domains can support those domains with very sparse and few failures to extend the value of the data that you've recorded. So at this stage, I'm gonna move out into the Jupyter Notebook to show us building the model on a demo data set and then we'll come back into the slides to, um, to return to the practical data. Um, so hopefully I will share this now. So I'm hoping now, let's see, yeah, it seems like people can. Yeah. Okay. So this is now in the Jupyter Notebook, which is available in the GitHub repository if people would like to have a look and um, play with the code. As a bit of a back, uh, there's, there's a bit more detail in this Jupyter Notebook, so I'll go over it relatively briefly, but people can return to it if, if they want to read, read a little bit more. But survival analysis is a branch of statistics which is used to uh, assess the expected duration until failure. In particular, in this scenario, we're interested in the proportion, um, sorry, of the assets that survive for a given amount of time, at what rate will they fail at that time? Um, it can also be used to determine things such as the effects of specific environmental operating conditions on the 
on the probability of survival. It's useful, particularly in the context of population models, to consider parametric survival models. These are appealing because they're interpretable. Um, in this scenario, we base our analysis around the Gompert survival model. And this is the distribution over the expected time of failure for a given component. This equation isn't so important, but the, the interpretable part comes from the existence of these two parameters. Gamma corresponds to the initial rate of failure or the baseline rate of failure, whilst phi is the exponential, is the coefficient for the exponential rate, uh, rate of increase in the rate of failure. Um, in terms of what this model actually looks like, I think it's useful to first consider the distribution over the expected age at failure for a given component. And if we define a certain unit, whatever that, that may be, of life, and then we define our two parameters, we can plot the distribution over our expected age at failure. And here we can see the, uh, the top of the hill or the peak of the mountain corresponds to the most likely age at failure for that model, for that parameterized model. And then in, in this scenario, it's around 95, uh, a, an age unit of 95, which could be years, um, which is the likely age at failure. The convenient thing about these probabilistic hazard um, survival models is that the associated hazard function is also parametric. For the Gompertz model, the, this is a y equals mx plus c. This is a straight line, a linear line. The intercept is the log of the gamma parameter, while the gradient is the phi parameter. We can then rewrite this, um, this expression in, with linear algebra in vector notation, and we, and we arrive at something that looks very similar to the linear regression model that I was showing um, earlier in the slides. If we then plot the corresponding hazard function, it's a nice straight line, which is characterized by those interpretable parameters that we've discussed. There's been a bit of a spoiler in that we know that the hazard function in practice doesn't look as, uh, as dreamy as this. It's not a simple and straight, straight line. Instead, we have different failure modes within our fleet. We have different vehicles and use types and also different components. And in turn, our population model becomes a set of functions. So rather than having one nice uh, linear regression, we instead have a, a mixture and the number of regression functions. And this can be shown here is that we have a set of K functions that we wish to learn and that we believe to be correlated. We can generate a, a group of survival models in this way. We generate a set of parameters, baseline, hazards, and uh, gradient coefficients, and we're able to create a mixture of survival models, and our corresponding hazard space looks very similar. And we can see now that we're getting towards the practical example of hazard data provided by the truck fleet. Although this is closer, we can still see that there's some key differences between our parametric model of the hazard data and the uh, practical hazard data. In particular, while these are mainly linear, particularly for later, um, for a later or older age of the components, instead we have this non-linear um, kick at the bottom for early hours in life. So instead, to make this simulation a little bit more realistic, we include a similar non-linear component for early hours in life for a demo data set, which is shown here. So. We now have to consider that whilst a certain area of our input domain can be explained by a Gompertz linear model, there is this nonlinear effect at, towards early hours in life, which we have to model by some means. In this scenario, we include an additional component within the model, which is shown here. And this is a linear regression over some spline basis functions. And this essentially just models our discrepancy as we deviate from the linear Gompertz model and and a sort of curve away from it. The way that the priors are defined in, in this manner um, are detailed in the paper, and I'm happy to discuss it if anyone's interested, but we center it in a way such that our prior belief is focusing on the Gompertz, the interpretable Gompertz model, 
and we allow for the discrepancy to be modelled um, to deviate away from that belief. We can then implement this model in STAN, the probabilistic programming language STAN. The STAN files for the models are also available on the GitHub repo, if anyone is interested to check them. We then have to define our input data, which are simulated. We define our spline to model the discrepancy and our input design matrices, and we can learn our model. We also can diagnose our model as well, and we get the predicted parameters for each, for the data-rich domain only, I should say. And in this example, I think it's probably most intuitive to keep going and talk about the posterior predictive, but we can see that our model is sensible and that we accurately predict the functional behavior of the hazard curve for the data-rich domain. Our predictions are shown by the green, the uh, green curves here, whilst the ground truth is shown by the white, the white line, and our data by, by the scatter markers. So if this works really well, why is there a motivation to share information between domains? If we then learn the same model independently for each task in turn, such that they are uncorrelated and there is no, there is no information sharing, we can loop through each domain one by one and apply the same checks. And if we look at the posterior distribution, whilst we're very, we have a good representation in our data rich domain, as our domains become more and more sparse, we, we return to our prior intuition and we essentially approximate the data with a linear Gompertz model. There isn't enough information in the um, purple and pink domains to describe the discrepancy from our Gompertz model. If we instead move towards a population level analysis using hierarchical bays with mixed effects, there is two clear ways in which we can start to share information between models. The first is to have varying effects. These are where you have a distinct set of parameters for each model in your population. However, you correlate them via a shared um, parent latent variable or an empirical prior in the hierarchical Bayesian setting. This is also learned from the data so that each model can influence each other. The other way to allow for information sharing is to tie the parameters and learn them at the population level. So as we did when we were discussing the noise effect, we can tie the discrepancy. What we are saying is that we believe that the parametric deviation from a linear Gompertz model is consistent for all subgroups within the fleet. We can then build our hierarchical model in STAN again, and that, that file is available. And if we collect all of our population data together, and we then put, use those as inputs to the model, and we can infer the parameters of the population in a combined inference, at the same time allowing for information flow between domains. And now rather than having one estimate of our intercept and slope, we have one for each, each task in the, in the collective group. In turn, by allowing information to be shared in terms of correlated variables and tied parameters, we have a much better approximation of the underlying function, particularly in those domains that are sparse. And this is mostly to do with the fact that we're learning the discrepancy from our deviation in, at the population level. We're no longer learning that for each domain individually. So now I will jump back to the slides as they are slightly more motivating than the simulated example. Lawrence, there's actually two questions. Um, I don't know if it would make sense for you to address them before jumping back. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, yeah. Three questions. Okay. Um, so there was one question, I think, a few minutes ago from Aiden in the Google Doc that I've just um, pasted. It's the first one. I won't read it since it's quite long. Uh, but after Aiden's question, there's actually two more questions that maybe it would make sense to address now. Um, okay. So Aiden's question is in. Oh, yeah. Does each YK or FK have to predict the same quantity of interest? This is okay. So, Aidan's asking if um, does the prediction onto your response variable have to be the same quantity of interest across your fleet, or can the observations be different and, and potentially correlated? Um, I would say 
in that scenario, I'll wait, I'll try and get rid of the infinity. No. Um, it's, it makes sense to try and inform these models with your engineering knowledge as far as possible. And they obviously only detect correlation and not causality. So say if you had reason to believe the correlation was well informed. So in an engineering context, if you're measuring sort of the velocity and the acceleration, and you wanted to correlate two models based on measurements of either velocity or acceleration, that would make complete sense. And the correlations in that scenario would work well, provided there is a linear correlation. Um, so it doesn't have to be the same, but you have to be careful of which variables you're allowing for information to be shared. There's also an option to um, hope that the models will automatically detect an appropriate level of correlation, which I will talk about a little bit towards the end. I hope that answers the question. No problem. Um, and then have you created a benchmark between the model and other model, which are considered as black boxes? At the moment, we haven't. We haven't benchmarked against black box methods. I know there's a lot of neural network methods, which essentially do the same thing in large correlated models. Um, but the focus here was to try and define interpretable parameters that we could justify our levels of parameter tying across different groups within the population. That's not to say that uh, black box methods don't have their advantages, they definitely do. It's just that in this scenario, we wanted to know what we were tying and where, if that makes sense. But it would be useful to benchmark against black box for sure. Um, no, no problem. Uh, for a machine to create a single general model that performs predictable. So this is a good point as well. And in this scenario, we are still learning separate models so a, a, a number of tasks over the population, but we're correlating them by shared parent nodes. I think what you're talking about here where you learn a single general model is more of a domain adaptation approach where you try and project all of your data into a shared space whereby they are similar enough for you to learn one model at that higher level. And both of them are valid methods, but it's worth saying that here each, you do have a number of separate models that you can predict separately for and you share at that, at that higher level. I hope that also answers that question. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I think maybe in that case, I will continue. Um, so moving on now, um, we can look at the same set of experimental steps whereby we learn these independent models for each task of the real operational data where the k equals one is our most data rich domain and we move progressively towards more and more sparse domains. The most extreme being the eighth domain or the eighth task where there's only one observation. Uh, there's only one failure within that subgroup. The independent models obviously don't allow for information to be shared, in particular with tied parameters. If we instead move to the population level, we have a much better uh, representation of what we expect the hazard curve behavior to be. In particular, we have the gray domain, which essentially borrows a large amount of statistical strength from those data rich domains, as there is only one observation, and we have an appropriate uh, increase in the uncertainty in that domain. It's also useful to consider variance reduction in our parameter estimates. So a more tight and narrow distribution is associated with a better, well, a more confident prediction. And in particular for the sparse domains, for the intercept or our baseline hazard, we have a much more concentrated distribution around our predicted value. And the same is true for the slopes in this scenario. I will skip the other parameters, which we can return to in questions just in view of time. What's also relatively intuitive is that we can extend our population to consider other kinds of components within the fleet. In particular, in the paper, we focus on extending the population to consider turbocharger failures. And we use the structure of the alternator functions to help inform the turbocharger predict predictions. Um, it's worth saying that this requires more careful consideration because you have to justify the level of information sharing. For example, we're missing data in this lower portion of the turbocharger hazard curves. 
and by tying, well, by allowing correlated variables between these domains, we use the data from this domain to represent a relatively low uncertainty there. And there's a discussion of, of when this is appropriate within, within the paper. What this allows for is an intuitive representation of the correlation structure. So this is essentially the level of similarity between different variables across different models. And as we can see, the slopes are much more correlated for the turbocharger. Um, there's a correlated block associated with the turbocharger models and also a correlated block associated with the ultimate models. And there's two clear groups that share information. Similarly, the same can be seen for the intercepts as well. Okay, so there was an option for questions there, but I might... Okay, there's one. Oh, is there okay. one? Yes. The ability to share information from one is to explain to another. Okay. So what if the, the, the reason in the difference or the sparseness of your data is because there's a difference in the underlying, sort of the generating process of your data. And this is, this is really important. And it, in the context that we've been discussing, it's heavily dependent upon the definition of your prior and the informativeness of that prior. Um, if you are incorrectly confident about how similar your systems are and you encode that knowledge within your prior, the issue that you're talking about will happen whereby you share more information than is necessary. However, you hope that if you set your priors to be vaguely informative or even uninformative, the data will only encourage a level of information sharing that is evidenced by the process. If, you, if, if that makes some sense, it's, it's a really important consideration and the way to deal with it is to set vague priors and let data inform the level of correlation rather than your your prior intuition. Um, but it's something important that has to be considered. And I would say uninformative priors are the way to go if you if you can't really justify the fact. If, if you don't know that the generating processes are similar, you should have an uninformative prior over the variance parameter, which in effect controls your level of information sharing. I hope that helps. No problem. Okay, so I think yeah, we have time. For the... So I'll go through this example, I think, relatively quickly. But this is applying a very similar model structure to a wind turbine case study, which is associated with power prediction over the same model of turbine, but in different locations. Um, so therefore there's different environmental conditions and um, different operational conditions as well. The data were kindly provided by Visual Wind and they were recorded using SCADA acquisition systems over a period of over 20 weeks. So again, returning to what is, is a important step of defining what this function is that you're, le that you're learning over your collective fleet. In this scenario, rather than hazard functions, we're learning power curves. The power curve is the power produced by a wind turbine against the corresponding wind speed. With a SCADA acquisition system, this is typically recorded in 10 minute averages and the associated power curve data are shown on the left hand side. The power curve is useful for monitoring and also predicting when forecasting as it captures a specific relationship for a certain design of turbine. The key thing in this application, again, is the categorization into your groups, which each have specific tasks. In this scenario, we have two groups to consider, not just one. So we kind of have L card decks rather than just one card deck of K cards, if that makes sense. The two groups are we have K turbines. So we have three turbines, blue, orange, and green. But we also have two operating conditions. One is the normal operating condition, where it limits the maximum power. And one is a curtailed operating condition where it is limited by the controller for a number of normal reasons to meet the requirements of the grid, as well as planning regulations and other things. Again, it's useful to define a parametric model in this setting so that we can specify which parameters we tie and which we learn at the population level. The first is that we have a zero expected output power before the wind reaches the cutting speed for that particular turbine which makes sense, I, I think. 
P is the corresponding cut in speed, which is the wind speed at which the rotor starts turning. We have the initiation of curtailment, the limit to maximum power, which is, which is parameterized by Q. And then we also have the rated wind speed, which is the point at which it reaches its limit and the maximum power which would be different depending on whether you are in the ideal operation or some limited operation. So again, we're at this stage of defining which effects we believe to be fixed over our group and which we think are varying. So it's useful to look at the data in this setting and hopefully zero power before cut-in makes sense. All turbines should be zero power output before there's any wind. I mean, it'd be a great turbine if that wasn't true. Um, then the cutting speed, because these are all the same model, is the same for all turbines. The two change points which correspond to the beginning and end of curtailment are varying. So even if the operational condition is the same, the location ha also has an effect on the, um, on the point at which the power curve begins to limit towards its maximum value. And then possibly the most interesting is the maximum power, because this is a mixture of tied and fixed. It's tied between operating conditions, so it's expected to be the same for the ideal operation for all turbines, because it's the same model. Um, however, for different operating conditions, we either have the maximum quoted power or some fraction of that, which is associated with these lighter um, markers where the data are being detailed. So we can apply the same modeling structure that we've discussed in the other applications and look at reductions in the posterior predictive. These are slightly less um, motivating than the last example because the data are less sparse, but there is still some reduction in our posterior variance, in particular for those domains that have more weakly described uh, maximum power. So the ideal curve for orange doesn't reach its maximum power, maximum values so frequently. So our characterization is reduced by allowing that parameter to be tied across the group. And the same is true for the catalog relationships. To, there's a detailed discussion of all the behavior of all the parameters in the paper. However, I think the most interesting is how we're able to predict maximum power on turbines that haven't um, yet operated in the maximum power region as frequently. For the ideal turbines, the green and orange are less well described than the blue. And when we tie the parameter, the parameter essentially shifts towards, shifts towards the data rich domain. So the population model learns that parameter from the domains which describe that effect well, if that makes sense. And the same is true for the curtailed relationships, which neither of them are as well described as the ideal um, operating condition. So this leads to a less significant variance reduction, but it's appropriate because the data are more varied for the curtailed curves, as you can see. Again, we can look at our correlation structure, which is hopefully quite intuitive in that we have our three normal operating conditions, creating a block of correlated variables in the top, in the top left, and then our curtailed relationships in the bottom right, which create the other block where this can be used as sort of a useful tool to indicate which systems are automatically allowing for information to, to be shared. So this is kind of uh, in response to Katie, the discussion about setting up priors. If your priors are appropriately weak, this will only, you will only see this correlation occurring where it's appropriate rather than being forced by your prior intuition. Okay, so if there's any more questions, here's the moment. Otherwise, we'll hand over to Rishi. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> um, actually, I think you can just change to here. What happens if I do this to the presentation? I think we're good. It's a trend, I think. Or it might not be. You might have to scroll through it. Well, I'll just do it like this. It's on. Maybe if you stop sharing, do it again. Right. If you do it again. And it's the few volumes. Oh, okay. Second. Yes. Yeah, this seems good. I'll just, I'll just present it from here.
Um, so, yep. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Rishi from Cambridge, and I'll be discussing the final case study where we use a hierarchical model to model times to failures observed in a fleet of turbofans. Turbofans are machines that convert the combustion energy into mechanical energy most of the times to drive the fan, like the, the, the propeller for the aircrafts. In this case study, we use simulated turbofans, which are simulated using the CMAPS software, which is, uh, which is a software developed by NASA. Uh, this software simulates turbofans operating in diverse conditions and also simulates them starting from the healthy conditions until their failures. Uh, in this case study particularly, we are working with a fleet comprising of 200 turbofans. Each turbofan uh, could fail in either of the two failure modes, which is HPC, high, comp high pressure compressor failure, or the fan degradation. Uh, but all, all the turbofans operate in same condition. The only thing that separates uh, one turbofan from the other is the rate of degradation or the initial health condition. While simulating the turbofan operations, uh, the simulator also records various operating parameters, internal and external, throughout the turbofan operations. These parameters are, lift, are, are listed on the right-hand side. Um, in this case study, we only focus on the ones highlighted in bold because these are the ones uh, specifically which show trends uh, as, as the turbofan fails. So we deem that uh, the, these operating parameters are the ones which actually show some predict predictive abilities. In this case study, we are going to model the times to failures using a viable distribution. Uh, I'll be discussing two experiments where we compare uh, the population level modeling with independent modeling and another experiment uh, like uh, with, with increasing number of failures to compare the convergence rate. And in the other another experiment, um, I will be discussing the effect of the higher level parameters on, uh, on, the, on the parameter estimations for the viables corresponding to each of the sub -feeds. Uh, but to begin with, uh, let's discuss some something about the viable distribution. And the important parameter in this is the shape parameter, which is denoted here by alpha and also highlighted in yellow. This parameter is particularly important because it governs the maintenance planning in the industries. So depending on the value of alpha being less than, equal to, or greater than one, it corresponds to decreasing constant or increasing rate of failure. And particularly, the industries are, uh, are interested in increasing the constant rates of failure to plan their maintenance activities. This is denoted by the two graphs uh, shown on the right-hand side, which have the same scale parameter but different shape parameters. Uh, when we model all the observed time to failures, times to failures in our, in our turbofan fleet, uh, you can see that the, although the, the inferred viable is highly confident. So on the graph, we are showing actually uh, the inferred viable and also the, the central 80 percentile, but the variance is so low that it just shows as a single function. Now, although the distribution is, uh, is associated with the low variance, there is a high bias, primarily because there is a wide range of times to failures um, within the fleet. And also, if you look at the empirical log hazard curve that Lawrence discussed, uh, during the during the Scania case study, when we plot a similar log hazard plot for the turbofan fleet, we can see that there is a wide range of times to failures observed, and also a, also the log hazard curve is split into multiple functions. So it can be we, we can deduce that oh yeah the fleet comprises of sub fleets of turbofans which which show similar degradation. Uh, but but off off right from the data there is no indication of sub fleets. So to identify the subfeeds, we rely on the operations data. Uh, so what, what we show on the right is right on the, on the top right plot is the time series of a single operating parameter uh, across, along, the, along the life cycle of the turbofans. So it is a normalized value, but as you can see, as the turbofans degrade, the, sen the, the sensor values deteriorate, uh, they, they, they deviate from the normal operation and depending on the failure mode or rates of degradation, it, it shows like the sensor values uh, deviate differently. To distinguish between the, the rates of degradations, we can't directly, it, it's, we can, but it's, it's, it is challenging to directly compare the time series because of varying lengths and also the high dimensionality. 
So in this case, we actually fit quadratic polynomials to each of the sensor time series. So in the bottom right plot, we show how, uh, how a quadratic polynomial is fit to each of the time series. Um, following this, so, so essentially each sensor value reduces to three coefficients of the time uh, of the corresponding polynomial. Uh, then we further, uh, further apply PCA to each, uh, each of, to, to, to the vector of coefficients associated with each of the turbo fans to further reduce the dimension. And in this case, uh, we, we consider the first 10 components which explain up to 99.7 percentage uh, variance in data set, which is, which is already quite high. And using these transformed, uh, transformed data, we use k-means clustering to identify number of clusters. Now, while implementing k-means clustering, we iteratively keep increasing the number of clusters until, uh, and we, when we keep increasing the number of clusters until we see that uh, upon increasing another cluster, the overall inertia does not decrease a lot. Uh, specifically, we, we stop when the overall inertia decreases by less than 5%. So we end up with 11, 11 clusters or 11 subfleets in this case. This, uh, this slide summarizes all the steps involved to identify the subfleets, where we start by identifying the sensors that actually correspond to predictive, like actually deviate as the turbo fans deteriorate, and followed by the clustering steps that I just discussed. When we look Sorry. Sure. Yeah. So uh, on, on the right hand side, you see the, the normalized sensor values, the, the same sensors as um, 15 that I showed before across all the turbo fans comprising different clusters. And as you can see, each, each cluster is associated with its own uh, rate of degradation. And the direction of deviation corresponds to, to the two failure modes present in the fleet. If you look at the log hazard curves for each of each class, the log hazard curves corresponding to the, the subfleets, we can see a better separation of the log hazard curves indicating that uh, we are able to actually cluster the fleets. We, we infer independent Bibles for each of these subfleets, but the Bibles share the, the Bible parameters share common higher level distributions. In this case, each viable parameter is associated with a normal distribution. And uh, the, the graphical model of the viable is shown on the right. In the first, in the first experiment, we pick a cluster and we, we pick one of the subfleets from one of the subfleets and we keep increasing the, the number of failures observed in the subfleet from one until both independent and hierarchical uh, hierarchical viable models can merge. So while inferring the independent viable, we ignore the presence of other subfleets in the fleet, and we just aim at uh, we just aim at inferring the parameters from the observed failures. And as you can see, the hierarchical model converges much sooner than the independent models because it is able to learn from other clusters in the other other subfleets in the fleet which already have more information. In the second experiment, we look at the higher level para the effect of higher level parameters on the inferred viable parameters for each of the clusters. So just going back to the previous slide, here each viable parameter has an associated variance uh, higher level parameter. And if the operator of the feed uh, deems that, oh yeah, the clusters are much similar to each other, then they can just reduce uh, the the variance to zero, which corresponds to like just learning a common model across all the assets, or they can set the variance to a very high value, which which would correspond to each uh, correspond to the independent modeling of the subfleets. In this case, uh, so on, on the top is is shown for for the case, for inferring the shape parameter, and uh, at below is shown for inferring the scale parameter, and in then we, we vary the higher level variance from very low to very high while letting the other other variance parameter being inferred inferred from the data. Um, moving further, I'm going to discuss how to use the uh, how to use the hierarchical model for real time prediction in operating assets. So in this case, you have uh, you, you, you already have observed failure in the fleet, but then you have new asset, which is midway through the operations, uh, 
So the goal is to predict the failure for this asset which is operating. To do that, we we first cluster the observed fa observed failures in the fleet using just the data that is being observed in the operating asset. So essentially, we are answering the question that uh, up to the time of operation of the current asset, which uh, which assets in the already which which assets which for which the failure has been already observed have shown a similar behavior. And after that, we look at the closest cluster for the operating asset and the mode of the viable distribution corresponding to the closest cluster uh, shows the expected time of failure. In a schematic representation, this is how it would look for an operating asset. So initially, when you have very little data, you, you can't make out uh, you can't make out the clusters in the fleet because it, you just don't have any data, so you can't make out how how the asset is uh, the, the similar observed failures. But as as you keep getting more data, the predictions keep being more confident and narrower. Uh, and this is how it looks for an actual operating turbo fan. So to get this to get this plot, we 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 just selected the initial uh, time steps from the failure trajectory of a turbo fan. And we incrementally kept adding the data. So as you can see, uh, the vertical black line corresponds to the current time step of the operating turbo fan. Uh, and the thick blue line shows the actual time of failure. The vertical red line corresponds to the predicted time of failure. Uh, so as, as the turbo fan keeps operating and we have, and we keep, gen keep obtaining more data, set, more data uh, the predictions keep being accurate and also more confident. Now, finally, we, we tested how this works for uh, for our fleet. So we divided the, the fleet into 80% training and 20% testing data set. And in the testing data set, because the time, because the time series were of varying lengths, we divided into 10 segments and we calculate the accuracy of prediction across the testing data set at each of these 10 segments. And it was observed that the, the accuracy of predictions keep improving as the turbofan, um, as the turbofans in the testing data set approach the failure. So the conclusion from this case study is that uh, the first one is that the hierarchical model converges much faster than the independent model. Uh, so in, so in, in a fleet where you have a sub fleet where not enough failures are observed, hierarchical models can help uh, to help help improve the predictions and enable maintenance activities. Secondly, hierarchical models also enable the operators to incorporate the expert knowledge about the fleet, which is often not possible for black box models, uh, probably. Uh, so, so you, you can actually incorporate the knowledge about uh, if the clusters are, if the subfleets are similar or if they are diverse. And lastly, in this case study, we also show how to use the hierarchical model for real-time predictions in the operating assets. Good. Thank you. Great. So I see we're one minute away from ending. Um, there is one question for you guys in the chat, so maybe you guys can respond in the chat and in the Google Doc. But thank you both, Lawrence and Rishi, for presenting today. Thank you to the audience for all the questions. Um, any last comments you guys would like to make? Uh, so yeah, just uh, to address Ethan's question. We we have submitted a paper. Uh, it's it 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 is it is in under review, but yeah, it's, it's going through. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. We, we are going to keep updated. Yeah, and then any further questions, put them in Google Doc. We'll be happy to answer anything. Thank you very much for everyone's time. Thanks a lot.